together to worship the Lord, and um, we're going to take a break from that. I usually don't do that, on, uh, on even on special days, but um, we've been gone, and I wanted to um, I wanted to be able to give ample study time to the topic, which next Sunday we'll be talking about singing and what role sing, why we as a church are to sing in corporate worship and uh, the purpose of singing, and I hope you'll be here for that. But we're going to look at Psalm 127 this morning, and Psalm 127 is a very practical psalm. It deals with work and family life, and this is something that every one of us Unless, I guess, unless you're retired at this point, but this is something that every one of us has to deal with, and especially us as fathers. Psalm 127 helps us to correctly prioritize our work lives and our family lives. In Psalm 127, there are no commands. Uh, there are no commands. You know, a command is, uh, you know, if your wife was to say, honey, take out the trash. That's a, that'd be a command, uh, maybe a nicely, a nicely, uh, a nice command. Maybe she said it in a nice way, but it's still a command. It's an imperative, and there are no imperatives in this chapter. This psalm is a wisdom psalm. It's a psalm of Solomon. Many of the psalms were written by David and other authors, but this one is from Solomon. And if you remember who Solomon was, uh, I'll sum it up this way: He had a lot of wisdom. He had a lot of wealth, and he had a lot of wives, and that is Solomon in a sentence. Let's go ahead and read Psalm chapter 127. It says, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gates. Let's pray for our, our time this morning. Father, I do thank you for your word. I pray that you would honor it this morning. I pray that uh, it would. we know it's not going to return void. And God, I pray that you, your spirit would do, um, that your, uh, your Holy Spirit would do his work through the word this morning. And I pray that it would cause us to be more like Jesus as a result. God, I pray for anyone here this morning that is, has not turned to Christ, that has not turned from their sin and placed their faith and trust in him. I pray they would do that before it is too late. Father, again, we ask for your blessing on our time this morning. And it's through Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I just want to give you two simple points this morning. The first is from verse 1, and that is, that you should trust in the Lord for your protection. Trust in the Lord for your protection. In verse 1, we see God's sovereignty in two ways. The first uh, is in building a house. Uh, the, the verse says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. We also see God's sovereignty in uh, protection, in protecting a city says, unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. In other words, that, um, that we can do a lot of work and we can watch over our cities, our proverbial cities, but unless the Lord is behind us, then that work will be in vain. In the Old Testament, a house, someone's house, was a physical dwelling, and what did that represent? Shelter and security. That's what our houses do, right? They keep us uh, safe from the 95, or the 95 degree temperatures, uh, from snow, from rain. Uh, they keep us safe in a sense, keep us out of the elements. And uh, the, the house would also represent a family. That is where your family dwells. And so there's a, a great priority on our houses, our homes, 
and perhaps even uh, in America we see that our houses and our homes are sometimes representative of our status. They're a status symbol. That's the American dream, right? That we all, that you get married and you have a family and you are able to buy your own house. That's kind of the, 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 the shortest way to explain the American dream. And so we, um, we can resonate with this passage that we love to build houses. We love to have nice houses and that's okay to an extent. And many people, they find their security in their homes and their possessions. And that's what kind of what this psalm is addressing in a, lo- a little bit. It says, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. In other words, we, don't, we should not find our strength and our security in our homes and our possessions, but instead in God's strength. Uh, we should find our status not in the size of our home or how nice it is, but in our relationship with God if we are his child, if we are his children. Many people, again, find their security in their homes and their possessions. We think that if we can just build a house that's big enough or nice enough or new enough, that we will have security. But the verse says that unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. I thought about Genesis 11 and the Tower of Babel. The, the, uh, when all the peoples of the world had, had come together and what were they doing? They were trying to build a tower to God. They said, we're going to try to reach the heavens. And they tried to do that and they built an amazing structure. But it was in vain. Why? Because that's not what God had told them to do. And it was a waste. And God uh, caused them to not be able to communicate with one another. So you can have an amazing structure, you can have an amazing house, and it still be totally in vain. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. And I thought about, as well as our church, you can build an amazing, you can build a big building. You can uh, have a lot of people coming, but I'm telling you, you can if, you do, if your house is not built on the Word of God, it's just like a straw house. It's like the, the, the three little pigs, right? It's just going to be blown away. And so churches, they can, have a big, uh, they can have a big building. They can have a lot of people. But if it's not built on God's word, you can have a lot of people and you can still have a lot of people go to hell. I, was, I remember one church that I went to and uh, visited the church and it's actually the church that I grew up in when I was a kid, and I had went back to that church and was looking at maybe working there and being a, on staff as a pastor, and I went, and I remember the pastor, he, when I got there, he said, look at all that we've built. We have this nice building. We have this building. We have this. We have six church vans to pick people up. We have all this, and he was telling me all that, and he did not mention one time the lives that had been changed by the gospel. Because guess what? One of these days, this building will be burned up. But people's souls will live on. I thought about our Southern Baptist Convention. If we, the same thing, if we don't build, uh, build what we do on the word of God and the gospel and what God has done for us in Christ, if we don't do that, then it will not matter how big we get, how many millions or billions we can bring in. That unless the Lord builds the house, those that build it labor in vain. So we trust in the Lord for our protection. Second, we are to trust in the Lord for our provision. Trust in the Lord for our provision. Look at verse two. It says God provides the gift, or God uh, provides the gift of fruitful rest. Look at verse two. It says it is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. So in verse 2, Solomon is in some sense speaking to the workaholic, the person that cannot stop working. This is a person that they are always checking their email, they are always checking their phone, even in the, at their house and in off hours. They are always working overtime, they never take vacation time, They miss important family events. 
and they perhaps rarely are able to keep promises to their family. And notice what Solomon says. He says, it is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. We know that we have been commanded by God to work. That is um, that is something that was instituted before the fall. Genesis 2.15 says that God took the man and he placed him in the garden to work it and to keep it. So work itself is a good thing. It is a blessing from the Lord. But we also know that we will struggle with our work because of the fall, because uh, Adam, and Eve, Adam and Eve disobeyed God. In Genesis 3.17 uh, God said this to Adam. He says, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat of it from it. Cursed, or cursed is the ground because of you. In toil, that's that same word there, in toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. So work is harder than it used to be because of the fall, when we are right to recognize that. And sometimes hard work involves getting up early and going to bed late but we should not be working to the point that we are neglecting sufficient physical rest and our family's spiritual care we cannot work so much that we are so tired we never get to spend time with our families and that we never are able to teach God's word Deuteronomy 6 you go back and you, you, that scripture that we just read and you think about Moses' commandments to the Israelites and I guarantee you those Israelites worked harder than anybody in this room right? they had spent 400 years in slavery they didn't have any of the modern technological things that we have to help us they didn't have a microwave everything you did it was a manual process and yet God said what? you teach these things to your children This psalm shows us a better way, a life that begins with trusting the Lord in one's work. The blessing of God on the labor of the godly is such that we are provided with all that we need and we can rest without anxiety. Look at verse 2 at the end. It says, for he gives to his beloved sleep. He gives to his beloved sleep. That means that we work hard. We provide for our families, but at the end of the night, we know that God is in control. We trust him, and we can lay down our heads on our pillows. And I don't have to solve all the problems of the world and of my family because I know that he is on the throne. This morning, what bread are you eating? Are you eating the bread that comes from painful labors, or are you eating from the bread that comes from fruitful rest? Are you trusting in yourself and your hard work? Or are you trusting that God will provide for your every need? I've met people that they they have jobs where they can't ever come to church because they work every Sunday. And I'm not saying there are some jobs where you have to work some Sundays. I understand that. EMTs and nurses and doctors and there's many others. But I'm telling you the most important thing. uh, I've always said if I had a job where I had to work every Sunday I wouldn't do it. I would find another job, and guess what? I would trust that God would provide another job. It may not be the job that I like, but it is that important that I'm going to be with my family every Sunday morning in church that I'm able to. There is value in work. We are not to be idle people. We are to be people that work hard, but neither at the same time are we to make work an idol. We are not to be idle, but we don't make work an idol. Because again, what's going to happen one of these days? All of our possessions, all of our homes, they're going to burn up. And God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to establish his rule and reign. It's all going to be gone. But what's going to live on is you and your children, the souls of your children and grandchildren. If we aren't careful, we can try to make a name for ourselves. We can try to find our worth and our value and our identity in our work. And we can do that all without acknowledging God. And that path of self-reliance, if we're not careful, while of course we need to work hard, but in America, one of the things that's made America great in a sense is that we are people that work hard, that have uh, made it by pulling up their own bootstraps, if you will, if you want to use that language. And that works to an extent physically, but I'll tell you, if you try to do it spiritually, it will lead you straight to hell. Because if you think that you're good works if you think that uh, there's things you can do you can do enough things to earn your favor with God as you 
can when you're trying to provide for your p- families, you will be sadly mistaken. We are all fallen sh- we've all sinned, we've all fallen short of the glory of God. And God is so holy we can't even imagine. And we stand condemned before him, but he loves us so much that even while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That Jesus came, his son came and lived a perfect life, died on the cross for our sins. He, w- he was buried, and three days later he was resurrected, conquering sin, death, hell, and the grave so that we could have eternal life. But we must turn from our sin. We can't rely on ourselves. We turn from our sin and place our faith and our trust in him. If you haven't done that this morning, I want to encourage you to do that at the end of the sermon. Matthew 6, 25, what I just read, says, Don't worry about what you will eat or drink or what you're going to wear. Now, we typically don't have those kinds of needs in America. There may be some of you do, and we would be glad to help you with that if you do. We don't typically have that kind of need. But we do are still people that worry about many, many things. Jesus said this. He said the Gentiles worry about these things. He's saying it's, it's people that are unbelievers that are the ones that worry about what you're going to eat or drink or wear. And basically when we live in a life of constant worry and anxiety, we are living more like an atheist than we are as a Christian. Because we have a heavenly father that knows what we need. And what did Jesus say? Seek his kingdom first and he will provide for you. He will take care of your needs. Men, this morning, if you have a job where you have to work all the time, you can't come to church, that's what Jesus says. He says, I will take care of all your needs if you seek my kingdom, if you seek God's kingdom first. I will provide for you. You don't worry about that. We must discern the balance between the need for work and the necessity of rest. Sometimes that's a hard thing. Am I working too much? Am I not working hard enough? How am I doing with my rest? And for that, you may need to talk to some people. You talk to your spouse, first and foremost. Talk to some godly friends, perhaps your pastor, perhaps somebody in your life that can speak truth into your life and say, hey, brother, I think you're a little bit out of balance. Let's talk to some people. We need to work, but we also need to rest. We see in verses 3 through 5 that... um, God not only provides the gift of fruitful rest, but he provides the gift of children. Verses 3 through 5, he says in verse 3, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the, room, of the womb, a reward. In other words, children are a blessing from God. Children are given by God, and think about this. We talked about uh, God gives us rest. When are children typically conceived in a time of rest usually at the end of the day when uh, mom and dad are resting in biblical times not so much nowadays but in biblical times people realized that our children were a gift from God nowadays uh, children are seen as what a clump of cells um, less than human by many but the Bible says that children are a gift and a blessing from God the Lord now we could I could spend a whole sermon talking about that and we may do that sometime that's not the purpose of today why or you may be here or you may watch this later online why does God withhold sometimes why do sometimes people who want children or why are they not able to have children and that's a difficult question but I would say this take comfort in knowing that that God only does what is good and right for his children there's a verse in Isaiah 56 that will be on the screen here. It says this, To them I will give in my house and within my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters. I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. The desire for children is good and godly, but the most important thing is for us to be reconciled with God and for us to be his children. I've said this before and I've got some funny looks, but we are not all God's children. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that God created all of us. We are all made in his image. But John chapter 1 says, to those that received him, to those he, be- he gave the right to call him, ch- to, for them to be called children of God. John chapter 1. So we 
If we are without Christ, then we are not God's children. But my friends, if you are in Christ, you will always be his child. God does not leave us or forsake us. Look at verse 4. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. So you can imagine this warrior. What is a warrior? A warrior is someone, we don't do a lot of this, but a warrior is someone that goes to battle. And in this day and age, there was no bullets. A man would, or uh, somebody would go to battle with perhaps a sword, uh, perhaps a spear, but always uh, an arrow, a quiver full of arrows. And it says in verse 4 that these arrows, uh, when a warrior goes to battle, he has that quiver and he would pull the arrow and be ready to shoot at his opponent. And this verse says that children, the children that one has are like those arrows. You may go in, what in the world are you talking about? Well, think about this. Parenthood is an act of stewardship. Psalm 24 says that, Psalm 24, 1 says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Our children do not belong to us. Our children belong to God. Children are arrows in parents' hands, and they are to be directed at the glory of God. So if you think about pulling out an arrow, what is my target? My target, rather than shooting at an enemy, my target is the glory of God. Deuteronomy 6, Psalm 78, Ephesians 6 Fathers are, ch- are called to make disciples of their children and train them in the discipline and instruction of the Lord and to tell of how awesome he is. Our mission as fathers is not to help our children make good grades. Our mission as fathers is not to help our children to win every athletic award. Our mission as fathers is not to, for them to have the nicest house. Our mission as fathers is to point our children to Jesus Christ And to help them love the Lord their God with all their heart and mind and soul. Bodie Bauckham says this. He says, if I I teach my son to keep his eye on the ball, but fail to teach him to keep his eyes on Christ, then I have failed as a father. And that's a hard thing to say. And I know some of you in here may be saying, well, I, I have failed. But there is grace in Jesus Christ. Look at Luke chapter 15. Don't turn there. But go to Luke chapter 15 and the parable of the prodigal son. There is always hope in Jesus. There is grace at the cross. And I want to tell you, as you train your child, that does not just mean going to church. It does not just mean going to church. Paul said this. He said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. If your children and your grandchildren imitated your walk with Christ, what would it look like? When our children have gone into the world, the arrows are out of our hands. And it may be too late for us to bend them. It's not always too late, but in many ways it is. Verse 5. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Verse 5 is a verse that... Uh, You guys probably think that me and Bethany have taken very seriously. (laughs) Uh, It says, blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. Um, Yeah, we have, honestly. We believe that. I believe that, that you're blessed if you have many children. The more children you have, the more influence you have. That's not why I'm having many children. But I'm just having having children because I like my wife, first of all. But... uh, but children are a blessing. We recognize that. In, in Israel, a man viewed children as the instruments or the arrows of the continuing influence of his life. When you have many children, if your quiver is full, the fuller it is, the more of a family legacy you can have, the more influence you can have on the world. And if you haven't had a lot of children, that's okay. But you can have spiritual children. There are people that you can share the gospel with, raise up, disciple, mentor, and you can leave a legacy not just with your bank account and with your home and your property, but with the, the, the people you leave behind that you have trained for the kingdom of God, the arrows that you have sent out. The city gate was the place in the town. It was the courtroom, the gathering place, the marketplace, 
You remember when we studied the book of Ruth and we talked about Boaz, when Boaz went to claim Ruth as, his, as, as he was the kinsman redeemer, where did he go? The, the city gates, right? And that's where they had that funny ceremony where they took their shoes off. If y'all remember the book of Ruth when we studied that. The city gate was where it was all happening. It would be like the city hall nowadays or our, our, big, our courtroom, that big building where it has all the assessor, all the property, all that stuff that we don't ever want to go in there and deal with. But the city gate is where all that happened. In verses 4 and 5, we see that children are a gift from God. And listen to this. They provide us, in a sense, with the very thing for which men strive in vain. A man may toil anxiously to build a house, but by giving us children, God is the one who builds our home. The watchman stands guard to provide security and protection, but when God gives us children, he gives them a greater security. Why? When children are grown and strong by the time parents reach old age. A house full of children born before one becomes old is a protection against loneliness and abandonment in society. Think about Jacob and his 12 sons. You remember uh, Joseph ended up in Egypt, but what happened when that famine came? What happened? Joseph said, what are y'all all talking about? Just go to, in- go to Egypt and buy some grain so that we can live. And what happened? They went and they bought some grain and they lived. And little did they know that, their, that his son was second in command in Egypt. Jacob's sons were a protection for his life. These, when we raise them right, God, they have received a godly example at home. And when they come together in the city gate, the place where court was held, they can speak on behalf of their aging father in the presence of his enemies. For any of us without children, for any of you without children, you can trust that the Lord will care for you through the local church. God has given the local church to care for widows and widowers and orphans. We see that in the book of James and 1 Timothy and other places. So this morning, we've seen that Psalm 127 teaches that we are to trust in God for our protection and for our provision. We should trust in his sovereign care in our lives more than our strength and our abilities. We can work hard, but we should also sleep well and rest. As we trust in God's provision for our physical as well as spiritual needs. Romans 8.32 says this, He who did not spare his own son, how will he not give us all things? In other words, God loves us so much that he sent his one and only son Jesus to die for our sins. Why would he do that and then neglect to care for our, our physical needs? It doesn't make any logical sense. The hardest thing that God would ever do would send his son to die a brutal death on the cross. Caring for our needs is easy for him. This morning, are you trusting in him for your protection, for your provision? Are you trusting him with your eternal salvation? Or are you anxiously trying to earn the approval of God by your own religious works? Let's go ahead and stand.